it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. A serial killer broke into my house. That isn't even the scary part. By H. R. Welch. It was around midnight, a few years ago, when I heard the sound of someone breaking into my house. I don't think I had more than 20 minutes to sleep, but as soon as I heard the window being broken, I was wide awake and looking for my phone to call the police. Unfortunately, I'd left it downstairs, charging in the kitchen, the source of the break-in. After psyching myself up to go downstairs, I saw the silhouette of a man sitting at my kitchen table. It was dark, so I couldn't see him, but the stink coming off the man was enough to curl my nose hairs. It was obvious, even without the lights on, that he was homeless. I was about to throw him out, but as soon as I turned on the lights, I couldn't help but feel bad for this stranger. He was sickly skinny, dirty, with long stringy hair that grew in patches and a matching beard. The way he sat there motionless, with tears forming in his thousand-yard stare, it seemed to me that he'd given up on life. I was about to tell him to get out, but as soon as I opened my mouth, I noticed that he had a shotgun on his lap. I nervously asked him what he wanted, but he didn't answer me. Instead, he just sat still and stared straight ahead as if he wasn't even in the room with me. As a kid, I was instructed to give the homeless food instead of money, since they might buy booze or drugs with it. So instead, I decided to warm the man up with leftovers in the microwave. As I did so, I prodded the stranger with questions, like if he wanted me to call anyone. Well, he didn't answer for a long time, and hardly noticed the food I'd placed in front of him once it was ready. However, once he started talking, he told me a story that would change my life forever. He said his name was Cole Dyer, and admitted to killing 20 people. I'm not at all embarrassed to say that I cried and begged for my life at this point. This only angered Cole, who ordered me to shut up and sit down, so he could tell me something. Doing what he said, Cole told me that his first victim was a hooker who he'd choked to death. This one wasn't killed like the others because he didn't know how he wanted to do it at the time, or, for that matter, knew that he had a taste for it. After killing her, Cole expected someone to come by to arrest him. But after a while, with no detectives or police coming by, Cole figured he was in the clear. Finally having a way to vent his frustrations and no longer feeling like some cog in the machine, Cole's murderous fantasies took on a life of their own. Eventually he started to consider himself the Pass It On Killer. The reason Cole liked that name could only be explained by his twisted sense of righteousness and questionable moral compass, which was explained to me in great detail. Now, the gist of it was that if he killed enough pests, good things would come back to him. Symbolizing this, he'd replace the head of his previous victim with the most current. Realizing killing people he knew was a sure way of getting caught, Cole learned what questions to ask complete strangers to discover the pests in their lives because, well, who didn't like talking about themselves? Cole explained that he was great at talking to people and could talk the devil into lighting himself on fire. Because of this gift, it was easy for Cole to learn where these people lived, worked, and what they drove, and much more. Since the murders were spread out nationwide and none of his victims had any connection to the others, authorities were at a loss. They told the public they were chasing leads, but they never even questioned Cole about his hobby. It was at this point that Cole demanded that I grab a pen and paper and jot down this tale. Who was I to say no? Even though he had his hands on the table, well, there was still a shotgun in his lap. I didn't want to bet that it wasn't loaded or that I was faster than he was. Uh, the safe bet was just to write the story he was telling me and hope he'd show me mercy. While scouting for the 21st victim, Cole had found himself behind a small series of apartment buildings. It was here Cole started to shake as if he was scared. I uh, heard a small group of people huddled around someone's basement apartment, whispering to whoever was inside. They were a ways away, so I couldn't make out the details at the time, 
that I could see that something wasn't right about them. Uh, they were dirty, long greasy hair and beards. There was something else about them. Something, well, something evil. One by one, they'd stop their hushed whispering and turn their gazes towards Cole. This prompted him to return to his car, and on the way he dared a peek over his shoulder. When he did, they were following him, but stayed just out of the cone of light the street lamps provided. Oh, creep me out. I was already thinking of finding someone else to kill, because I don't like killing in apartment buildings. Too many neighbors, you know. When I saw them, though, I sort of settled it. Oh, I wasn't going to go back there. Kept looking back in the mirror on the way home to see if I was being followed, but in the five-hour drive, I didn't see a thing behind me. Next day, however, I noticed a car driving slowly through my parking lot every few hours. I was smoking lots of weed at the time, and I figured I was just being paranoid. But the next night, I woke up to a tapping on the door. As Cole explained to me what happened next, he started to rock back and forth the way I've seen children do it in an effort to calm themselves down before continuing the story. I uh, thought it was my imagination at first. Then I started hearing my name being whispered from the hallway. When I realized I wasn't imagining the noises, I looked out the peephole. Cole described at least five filthy and malnourished faces partially covered by long, unkempt hair, that did little to hide their dark, sunken eyes that shone with a kind of hate and sin that even the passed-on killer feared. Ah, oh, they spent the entire night begging me to come out. In the building Cole called home, it wasn't uncommon to hear drunken exes pound on doors demanding to be let in, so their begging went on for hours. Eventually a neighbor Cole never bothered to get to know, but shed a thin wall with, decided to open the door to tell the strangers to keep it down. Well, she stopped mid-sentence the moment she saw them, Cole explained. They pushed her back into her apartment and all piled in. They were tearing through her place for a while and I could hear her cry, which caused them to laugh. If I didn't have a head in the freezer, I would have called the freaking cops, man. Eventually, they made the woman call out to Cole, begging him to come out from his apartment. Cole could hear them telling her what to say. When she did, they'd laugh and instruct her to say it louder. When Cole refused to open the door or respond, they grew bored and started getting violent with the woman. First the sounds of punches and things getting broken, but then, oh Jesus, they were eating her. It was loud and wet and lasted until the sun came up. I didn't want to interrupt someone who was obviously crazy. After all, who knows how a madman thinks? The best course of action for me to take was to remain silent and allow Cole to go on for as long as he wanted. Cole didn't leave his room until noon. By then he was confident that they were gone and they were safe to leave. There was no way I was going to stay there. No freaking way. Cole barely touched the meatloaf I'd eat it up for him, because he was too distraught. Considering how he looked, I thought he was going to inhale it. After packing his car and making sure to remember the head of his previous victim, who he kept on ice, Cole went to some army surplus store to get what he needed to get away for a while. After Cole, this meant staying at a seedy hotel. About a week later... Just getting some grub at some grocery store. I'm just walking in the parking lot and minding my own business, right? That's when I saw them again. Drove up right behind me and laid on the horn. I didn't even bother getting something to eat. I just wanted to get the hell out of there. By the time Cole remembered that he'd left the head of his previous victim back in the mini-fridge at the hotel, he'd already crossed two state lines. I could tell this bothered him. At this point of the story, Cole had to take a moment, and knowing that he had a shotgun on his lap, I gave it to him. Hoping that my kindness would be repaid and I could keep my head once he'd finished his tale, I poured him some milk and offered him the rest of the baby carrots I had in the fridge. Cole traded his car for a van shortly after that encounter, because there was no doubt that whoever was following him knew what he was driving. 
Uh, at least I could sleep in the van, right? Saves money on hotels and shit. It only took five weeks or so after trading in the van that Cole crossed his pursuer's paths once more. This time he was in deep sleep when he heard them say his name, causing his eyes to shoot open, immediately locking on the dark eyes of a woman with the same sinister resemblance as the man Cole had seen outside his apartment. However, without a beard, this woman's disfiguration was more noticeable. When she smiled, it was like she didn't have nearly enough teeth. The few that she had were small and brown and grew frickin' everywhere. Cole explained this as his dirty fingers fidgeted with the gun in his lap. Like the gums and the inside of the cheeks and shit. Even in the dark, Cole could see their black eyes glow with hateful light, and when he turned over the engine, the headlights revealed dozens of her family, standing ten or so feet apart. Oh, someone naked, Cole explained, his eyes growing distant as he was reliving that painful memory. When they were standing still, smiling and just looking at me, like they were giving me permission to leave. Cole told me that he swerved to hit a few with his front tire, or to at least clip them with the van's fat ass. However, they all just stepped to the side, effortlessly avoiding getting run down. When I got the opportunity to ask what he meant by her family, he revealed that that was a recent term given to them. At the time, he thought they were demons or vampires, but no longer thinks that's the case for reasons he didn't share at the time. After that encounter, Cole abandoned the van and stole a car. It was confessed to me that this is what he was doing whenever he felt that they were closing in on him, usually with the sensation of a tightening of his chest or his balls. Triggered by anything from something he'd imagined seeing in the corner of his eye to the cries coming from a murder of crows. Zigzagging across the country, Cole made every effort to forever rid himself of these people and the hateful pulse that resonated from them. Cole would stay inside at night, and if he could, he'd sleep during the day. He'd pass the time by reading and listening to music. It was a surprise to me that he preferred classical, considering how he looked. Well, my shock must have been apparent, because Cole explained that Vivaldi's Concerto No. 5 was his favourite, and thanked his mother for getting him into tasteful music. While on the run, Cole would take odd jobs here and there to pay for what he needed to survive. A tractor assembly line in Michigan, a toll booth operator in Florida, and a semi-way station in Nevada. Whatever job paid him in cash, and as long as he didn't have to work at night, no matter where he found work, he would not stay long before feeling that they were closing in on him, and would more often than not leave before getting his paycheck. I'll spare you the details of what Cole felt he had to do in order to survive up to this point. Up to now, he'd been talking to me, a captive audience due to his shotgun on his lap, for well over four hours. The night Cole came to my house was shortly after leaving a place he'd stayed at for about three months, a loft above a bar in northern Canada. When asked why he'd want to live above a bar while on the run, Cole shrugged and said that he thought a bar full of people at night would keep him safe. When they finally arrived, they softly cried out his name from the back alley under his window. With all the music being played downstairs, Cole had no idea how long they'd been calling, but the moment he knew it was them, the giggling began. They flattered Cole by saying they were his biggest fans, and tried to prove it to him by telling him details that only the Pass It On killer would know. Ah, cutting off a head is hard. Even if you have power tools, it's messy shit. Took a while before I got the hang of it, though. Cole confessed, oblivious to my disgust. I rigged a bike pump up to a catheter, snaked it through the auxiliary nerve until it reached the superior van of Cala. Only took about two minutes before the blood stopped flowing. By then, removing the head was pretty much blood-free. Cole swore to me that up to this point he'd never spoken to them, but that night at the bar, he finally had had enough and accused them of being vampires due to the fact they needed permission to come in. Uh, as soon as I said that, everything went silent. I must have been used to the sounds they were making because I didn't notice it until it stopped. That's when someone with a strange accent told me that they weren't vampires, 
but in fact something else. Something that I... But Cole never finished this thought. In the silence that followed, I didn't know what he was going to do, and this terrified me. Might have been a lack of sleep on my part, possibly even momentary insanity, but I had to know who or what was chasing Cole. When I asked, he didn't answer, so I pressed my luck and asked him what else needs permission to enter a house other than vampires. Again, he didn't answer, and even though I knew it was a mistake to poke the bear, I started to ask again. As soon as the words started to leave my mouth, Cole reached into his inner breast pocket and pulled out what I thought at the time was paper napkins. After inspecting it for a moment, with an expression I've never seen before, Cole slapped them down on the table between us. Written on them in everything from pen to marker to pencil were the messages. Let us in. Open the door. And more. It's hard to tell what else was said because the writing overlapped. However, it was clear to me that these messages were written by dozens of people. As I picked up one to look at it closer and possibly ascertain what was written, my finger rubbed the glossy underside. Turning it over, I saw that it was a photograph, and in it Cole was sleeping in what appeared to be a small apartment. The next appeared to be him in an abandoned bus, a dirty attic, and so on. In some of the pictures, Cole looked twenty years younger, it made me wonder just how long he was on the run for. I know that stress can prematurely age people, but I had a hard time believing that the person in the picture and Cole were one and the same. Even though there was a part of me that knew what I was looking at, I needed to hear it from the man himself. But before I could ask, Cole said, I don't need permission to enter someone's house, as he stared blankly into the empty space behind me. He sat there quietly for what seemed like an hour before Cole said anything else. When he did, it was as if he'd suddenly remembered that he was telling me a story and picked up from where he'd left off. The part where they then cut the power to the apartment and the bar under him. It didn't take long before the woman tending bar that night was shouting at them not to come closer. They just laughed. Tore her apart and all I could do was wait until morning to come. Cole confessed this with a shake of his head as if to eject the thoughts from his mind. The thing is, Canada has some long nights during the winter, and I only had enough food for a few days. Cole didn't tell me how long he'd stayed in that room for, and I didn't want to ask. It was obvious from the thousand-yard stare that these events were still fresh in his mind, so I kept my mouth shut. When Cole left his room, he saw Gore sprinkled everywhere, like a trail of breadcrumbs that started from behind the bar and led right to my apartment. Careful not to touch anything with his bare hands, Cole told me that he'd empty the cash register and stole a toolbox from the back office so he could switch license plates whenever he felt the need to in the future to throw his pursuers off his scent. I don't know how to stop him, but I think I'd have a good idea of how to slow him down, Cole said, but before he could elaborate... He noticed that the sun was shining through the window, and we'd been talking for hours. Thankful that he'd gone another night without seeing them, and having someone he thought he could talk to, Cole thanked me for listening. I didn't know what to say to such a story. <laughs> what could I say? In the awkward moments that followed, I filled the void by rambling about whatever came to mind, eventually telling him about my boss and how he's always looking over my shoulder and wouldn't leave me alone as if this was at all similar to Cole's own story. I didn't think anything of Cole asking me if I liked my job, or where I worked at the time, and soon I was answering all of his questions. After a short while, Cole thanked me. At the time, I assumed that was because I took the time to listen to him. Then he took my car keys off the counter, and left without another word. Well, it might have been about ten minutes after Cole left before I called the police, and all I said to them was that my house was broken into and that my car was stolen. After all, if I said anything else, it might have made me look as crazy as Cole. Ah, maybe it was just me being tired, but I was truly afraid that the police would think I was insane if I told them the story Cole had told me. 
the more distance I put between myself and that night, the less real it felt. But then reality set in once I learned that my boss was found dead a few days later. According to the local newspaper, the Whisper Alley Echo, pieces of my boss were found all over his bedroom. Most people in town considered this to be a rumour to stir up newspaper sales, and I wanted to agree, but it was hard, considering Cole's tale. In the back of my head, the idea of what Cole told me being true kept teasing me. It bothered me so much that I ended up hiring a private investigator, a decision that I came to regret. A week later, I received a phone call informing me that my boss's head was found in the middle of another bloody mess all the way in Cleveland. Over the next few weeks, I kept thinking of the story Cole had told me. If those thoughts weren't front and center, they were creeping in the back, ready to pounce on a happy moment to turn it sour. Well, it didn't take long before I started seeing dark patches dart from one shadow to the next, disappearing as soon as I turned to look at it. At first, I chalked this up to being a mouse. The reflection off my glasses was just a lack of sleep. After all, it was much harder to sleep in a house that was broken into. Hoping it wasn't mice because of my hatred towards them, I bought some medicine in town so I could get some rest at night. It worked wonders when it came to getting shut-eye, but did nothing to stop me from seeing these shadows. With an embarrassing frequency... I'd imagine the reflecting eyes on the side of the road were Cole's night visitors, or think of them whenever I heard the house settle. It was as though toying with the idea of them being real was enough to invite them into my life. Well, don't recall what came first. Hearing my name being called out in public, the familiar sound of the cawing of crows, or the soft scraping at my screen windows at night. However, once I realized that the noises and the visions were real, there was no way to block them out. At night, the soft whispers were hard to make out, and the more I tried to ignore them, the more they took center stage. I couldn't tell you how many nights I stayed up just so I could put my ear up to the wall, but I can tell you it was worth the effort because, unlike Cole, I know what they want. The first night I opened the door for them was terrifying, like losing one's virginity. But even with Cole's descriptions, there was no way I could have been prepared for their appearance, because they resembled the humans the way a shark looks like a minnow. During these conversations, they instructed me to share Cole's story with the world, so some of his madness could rub off on others, and well, season the meat. As long as I did this for them, they'd allow me to live. With that in mind, it's only a matter of time before they come and visit you. Maybe it'll start with seeing shadows in the corner of your eyes, the sounds of whispering, or something similar to the cawing of crows. But no matter how it starts, you should know it's the beginning of the end. Once you've been seasoned enough, they'll strike, and when they do, you can thank me. A better and more successful pass it on killer than Cole ever was. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.